My name is Darren Lombroso. I'm a technical director at, at HR Wallingford, and um, I, I've kind of been involved in this subject area for a, for a few years now. And and we often have some maybe what could be seen as quite morbid uh, conversations in the office when we're doing this type of work, discussing the number of fatalities from floods. And people sometimes ask the question, well, why, why do you want to model loss of life and evacuation times for extreme floods and, and dam failures, particularly the, with regards to fatalities, because it, it is a bit taboo. But I think it's very important to understand how the numbers of victims of a potential flood is affected by different things, for example, roads being closed, how well warnings are sent out, how many safe havens or refuges there are. And it allows the number of um, fatalities to be estimated and as well as evacuation times. And the primary objective of this is to help to improve risk assessments for things like dams and flood defences, and also improve emergency planning for dams, for flood defences, for areas at risk of flooding, so that you reduce those number of potential fatalities, ideally to zero. So in terms of loss of life modelling for floods, um, I like to think of sort of different levels of modelling. So varying from what I call micro level models to macro level. And I'll explain a little bit what I mean by this on, on the next slides. So in a macro level loss of life model for floods, what you would have is if you've got, um, if you see in this slide here, you've got a number of people, say a thousand people living next to a, a river or an estuary with a flood defense. And you're looking to estimate the potential number of fatalities, risk to people under a flood event. What you would have in a, a macro level model is, is something very simple, which would say if the flood is of a certain magnitude, then you would get a certain percentage of mortality. So for example, if you had a thousand people there and you had a certain magnitude of flood, you'd say maybe 10% of people would die if the flood defenses failed, therefore you'd have 100 deaths. deaths. And you'd have a very simplistic um, estimate of the evacuation time by just assessing the average distance of everyone to safety and, and their time of travel. So that, that's in essence a very simple model, a macro level. In a micro level model, um, what you're looking at is the behavior of ideally each individual or group of people. So you, rather than having the thousand people lumped together, you have them all modeled individually. And you have a detailed representation of the paths and roads via which people can evacuate from the area of risk so that you're getting um, evacuation times for, in this case, potentially every, every individual person, how long it takes them to reach safety. And that's a more accurate met method of modeling, but it also gives you um, more of an insight in how you can improve emergency planning. And, and these type of models are often called agent-based models. And I, I put the question here, what is an agent-based model? Well, it's, it's where you model um, the agent is an individual entity and you're looking for the emergent behavior and it, the agent reacts with its environment. So one, th there's various models that are used and I'll give you a few examples in other fields. So one is, is for example, shoaling a fish. So you can model fish using an agent-based model, each fish being the agent, they each have a rule and they all react together and you get the emergent behavior, which is shoaling. So here we have a shoaler fish and below we have a model that we've done of, of shoaling fish and that's in the 7S group. And agent-based models, it's, it's, it's a term that's not always that well-defined, but I think there's, there's four key things that you need to have. You need, the agents need to be autonomous. That means they act without direct direction or direct intervention. Um, they're proactive so that they, you know, they have a goal-orientated objective. They react. So they react to their environment and changes to it. And there's what I've called social ability in that in the case of the fish, they're interacting with each other. And in the case of the floods, they may be interacting with each other. So, so just to give you some examples, again, from some other fields where agent-based models are used. So on the left, you can see um, a traffic model or a representation of a traffic model. And this was an agent-based model used in Germany. And the agents in this were the cars and cyclists. And the, this model was used to improve junctions for cyclists, to so see if it improved traffic flow, also to see if it improved safety. 
Another thing very pertinent um, is the spread of viruses. So, you know, you've probably seen, uh, you may well have seen Professor Ferguson from Imperial College and various others on the television and radio talking about models, you know, with regard to COVID-19. Many of the models, not all of them, but some of the models they're using are agent-based models, in which case the, the agent may be people. Um, and then you look at how you get the emergent behavior, how quickly the virus spreads given certain rules. And you can play tunes and look at how different interventions will reduce this, the spread of the virus. So I'm gonna to talk to you about today about an agent-based model that we've been involved with for quite a long time called the life safety model, which is um, used to, as I said, assess the, the risk to people, provide credible loss of life um, estimates for floods. And this was initially developed by BC Hydro. They're an electrical utility in British Columbia in Canada. And in about 2001, so almost 20 years ago, or just, just over 20 years ago, they started thinking about this. They have a number of big dams. So there's one of their dams. They have about 30 dams, which they generate hydropower from. And they wanted to get credible estimates of loss of life if there was a problem with one of these structures. And they wanted to use the, the readily available digital data sets they had. And they wanted to improve the, risk, re, the emergency response um, for their dam break planning and their emergency plans. So the way that we as HR Wallingford got involved, we had a very big European Union uh, research project that we were leading into floods in 2005, which commenced in. And, and one of the work packages was to look at improving evacuation and loss of life estimates from floods. And we started using their model. They gave us the model to use. And then um, in around, I think it was 2008, 2009, they basically gave us the model. So we've taken over ownership of the life to safety model since uh, 2009 time. So as I said, you've got these sort of two methods, two philosophies, I think, main to estimating loss of life from floods. So one is this macro methods, the fairly simple methods I've talked about. And those of you based in the UK may have come across something called the, uh, the flood risk to people methodology, which was developed, um, we developed for DEFRA, in about 2004. And that's a, a very straightforward and simple way of estimating risk to people from floods. So you need to make some estimate of people's vulnerability from, you can get that from census data. And then you just use um, simple characteristics of the flood, mainly the velocity and depth to get an overall estimate of the number of fatalities. So it, it's very simple to employ, it's very quick, but it doesn't give you much granular, granularity. Whereas the agent-based model, the life safety model that I'm going to talk to you about, you can model each individual, you can determine their fate through space and time. So it's a dynamic model. Um, and I will talk to you, it has been validated and I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the case studies um, as we go along. So it's been validated for coastal floods, dam breaks and tailings dams. It also has an evacuation model in it. So people can evacuate evacuated either uh, on foot or in, in vehicles. So it allows you, as I've said, to look at these emergency management interventions. So if you added numbers of refugees, uh, um, improved warning times, uh, if people can vert, uh, vertically evacuate, so go up in their house, how does that affect and reduce loss of life? And one thing that I repeat in, in this presentation, I've probably said a few times is, there's a lot of, uncertainty in, in estimating loss of life. It's an art as well as a science. So it's the, the purpose of the, 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 these type of models isn't to give you an exact estimate of the number of fatalities. You'll never get that. The, the key importance of these models is to look at the number of fatalities and then look at whether a simple or sometimes perhaps more complex intervention can reduce those fatalities to zero to improve your emergency plans. It's not about exactly getting the uh, accurate loss of life because you will never get that. There'll always be huge uncertainty. So as I said, the life safety model is an agent-based model. It, it, it basically, you set up what, what we term a virtual world with people, cars, vehicles, uh, buildings, which are the agents. Um, and they interact with the results from um, a 2D, two-dimensional uh, hydraulic model. So you need results from a two-dimensional hydraulic model. Most, it works with most hydraulic models, two-flow, InfoWorks, 
uh, Telemac, various others. Um, and you need those two dimensional results at a suitable temporal and spatial interval. So here we have a, an anonymized dam break, um, an animation. So um, the blue is the water from the dam and the dots are the people evacuating. So where they're yellow, they're evacuating. Where they've turned red, that's where you're getting fatalities. So this was um, something we did. So this is, is deliberately anonymized. And, and the black, I should say, are the roads so, or, or the pathway ways to evacuate. So you basically got up this virtual world, which has got properties in it, people assigned to properties, roads and vehicles, and that's interacting with the flood wave. So the, I'll just run that again. The blue is the flood wave that came from a two dimensional hydraulic model. And then the people are interacting with that. And then you get the output. So that's kind of an overview of, of the life safety model and the results you're getting. And, and people can have various states. So uh, in this slide, if you don't get a warning, you're probably unaware a flood's going to happen. But if you get a warning, then your state will go from unaware to being aware. You may then decide to evacuate and then hopefully you'll reach safety. So you can reach, um, you might have a planned evacuation by vehicle, by car. Um, you might decide to go on foot or you may be living in a house that you feel confident isn't going to get damaged by the floods and you decide to vertically evacuate i.e. go upstairs because you feel that that's, that's a safe route, you're going to be above the flood water level. So I'm, I'm going to show in these few slides just a few of probably hundreds or thousands of, of scenarios that can play out in the model, just to give you an idea of how it works. So in this scenario, there's someone in a building. They might be unaware that a flood's happening. If they're unaware, the flood wave arrives at the building. The building is destroyed and they're trapped inside they're probably died they to escape in a car and then as time progresses they reach um, a refuge a safe haven or they manage to go outside of the zone at risk of flooding so that's one scenario another way is um, someone might be in a building they might be unaware that the uh, flood is coming the flood comes and the water level is such that it, it, it overcomes them in the building or they may receive a warning and they decide it's best to escape on foot or they haven't got a car. And there's various things that could happen. So they might um, at some point become overwhelmed by the flood water. The velocity and depth of the water is over a critical value and they drown. Or they might get knocked over, toppled, as we say in the model, by the water. The water might then go down and they might be able to continue to safety. Or the water level might continue rising and they may die. So that's another scenario that may happen. Another one is if they get no warning, they're trapped in a, in a building where the, the flood water depth may exceed um, the, the roof of the building and they might drown in the building. They may be living in a building with two floors, so they decide to evacuate upstairs and they're safe, or the flood water level may be below a critical threshold and they survive. So these are just a few of, of many hundreds or probably thousands of, of combinations that can play out in the model. Um, just to give you another idea, this is a schematic diagram of, of a model. So what you see here is a, a, a very stylized, um, simple model where you've got the black lines are roads, the brown squares are houses, and the green circles are refuges or safe havens. And you've got this person starting here, and they want to go from their starting location, they've heard the floods coming to this targeted safe haven. So if you look at this slide, they want to go from point A to B. And so they can either go by car, they've got an option of going by car, that's along that orange route that's just popped up, or they could lead, decide, oh, we want to evacuate on foot along the dotted um, pink line. So if a flood starts coming, they've decided, they've heard the floods coming, they've decided to move, very simple, this, this animation. And at a certain point, they get overwhelmed. If you look at the slide on the, the view on the left, and they might get knocked over by the flood wave. Then at the next time step, it's possible that the velocity and depth of water is such that it totally overwhelms them and they say drown. So that's a very simplistic representation of how, how the model works. So you may be asking yourselves, well, well, how does all this work? Where do these the functions, you know, where do these thresholds come from? So there's been quite a lot of experimentation done to look at um, relating flood velocities and depths to stability of people, you know, uh, how much uh, 
velocity and depth of flood water can people withstand before they get knocked over, before they drown. So this graph here shows some um, information from experimental um, data that's carried out with people in flumes. On the y-axis, you have the flood hazard, which is, um, sorry, essentially the, the depth D of, and the velocity V of flood water with a factor combination here. And on the x-axis, you have, in this case, this is for people, the height and the mass of the people. And if you're down here, you're stable. You can see the zone. If you're below about a combination of one, you're stable. But as you start going up, as the, the um, velocity and depth increases and you get into this zone where you'll be toppled or knocked over. So the, there's various relationships for different agents, for buildings, for vehicles, for people that relate the velocity and depth to various states that they could be in. So again, this is a sort of simple representation where you've got, this is a generic um, representation of the type of functions that are used in the model. So on the y-axis, we've got depth of flow. On the x-axis, we've got velocity. So if you're in this green zone, that's somewhere where no one would be injured. So the flood water depth might be low, the velocity will be low. There'd be no damage to buildings. Vehicles will be able to drive through the flood water. When you get into this yellow zone, that's where you get people starting to be knocked over. They may be injured by the, the flood water. You'll start getting damage to buildings and cars will start to float. And when this red zone, this is where you start to get fatalities, building collapsing and vehicles swept away. And as I said, this is based on experimental data. So on the right hand side of this slide, you can see um, some photos from they're, they're taken quite a long time ago from some experiments that were carried out. You can see a person in the flume and the, the water um, depth and velocity is being increased until they're swept off their feet. And then below, there's also some uh, modeling there done with uh, different types of vehicles to see when different types of vehicles become unstable. So just to give you an idea where this, the life safety model has been used, it's been used um, in lots of different parts of the world um, for lots of different types of floods. So it's been used to do risk assessments for dams in Malaysia and Japan um, and the US. It's used by BC Hydro in Canada to look at the risk from their hydropower facilities. And it's also being used in fluvial floods. Um, we've used it on tailing dams for mines. And I'm gonna talk specifically about, um, briefly about four case studies where we've used it. Um, those are the ones that are highlighted in red on this map. So the four case studies are, are Canada, um, where it was used for emergency planning for tsunamis, a historical dam break in, in France, um, Canvey Island, which is in the UK, and then in Brazil, the Brumandinho tailings dam failure, which happened about um, just over two years ago. And I'll just give you some brief um, background to how we utilize the model in those four case studies. So the Canada case study, this was done by our, our, our colleagues, so our friends in Canada. Um, and there's a, a town on the west coast of Canada called Euclulet. And the local authority there was concerned about emergency planning for tsunamis. And the reason they were concerned is that there's a, there's a fault line off the uh, west coast of North America. If you have an earthquake and then you have a tsunami, you don't get much warning time. You probably get about 35 minutes um, warning time. And the guys in Canada, they did some um, earthquake and tsunami modeling. So here we have a still from their tsunami model. So the, the red square is where the town of Euclidets is. And you can see this wave coming in. Um, this is a depth of the wave. So it's about a five meter high tsunami coming in. And when it hits the coast, it's still about five meters high. And I should add my understanding from our, our Canadian um, colleagues who've done work on this, that Euclid, which is that um, um, part of it, is, is fairly low lying and there's no obvious changes in the topography. So what was done initially was they did the tsunami modeling and they looked to see which buildings were vulnerable to the hazard. So that's a map of the buildings. The ones in red are the ones that would get severely damaged if there was an army, the ones in green, lesser so. But the reason for using the life safety model was to look at evacuation modeling. So here we have a still from one of the animations, and this is a still of the traffic model. So each dot represents a car, and they're trying to move to that safe haven at the bottom, which is green. 
uh, where there's some cars in red, that's where there's a traffic jam. So this was a, an evacuation simulation with one refuge. But what was actually done was that the refugees weren't refugees as in building, so to speak, they were parts of the road because what they found was that there were certain parts of the road which weren't at risk, they were above the level of the tsunami. And here we have a slide showing, if you can see in the center, there's some pink roads. They were designated as being safe as refuges. And then the life safety model was run to see how long it would take people to reach there. And you can see you've got the different distances away from there, red being further away uh, and green being the nearest. So that was with just one set of roads there in the middle being refuges. And then the life safety model was run with lots of different refuges. So you can see you've got different stretches of pink road, which act as refuges throughout the town of Eucalypt, and, and that was seen, how does that affect and reduce the fatalities? So often what happens in, in different parts of the world, and it happens in the UK, the health and safety executive have them, you have these graphs of probability of an event happening, this is on the y-axis, against the number of fatalities. And it's, it's government departments, or different authorities define the level of risk in terms of the probability and number of fatalities that they feel comfortable or they think that society is, is comfortable with. So this is one that was used in this particular case study in Canada. So you can see that there's um, this line of tolerable risk for accidents. So with no emergency planning, you, you've got this blue line, which was felt by the local authorities to be unacceptable. With the one refuge in place, the one set of roads, you can see you can reduce that line, the number of fatalities, to almost below the tolerable risk for industrial accidents. And if you have multiple refuges, then you can reduce that to what was felt by the local authorities and the policymakers in Canada to be an acceptable level of risk. So that's what was done. And this did actually result in some action. So as I said, before the modeling, it wasn't obvious where the refuges were the safe havens and which parts of roads people should stop on. And I should add that my understanding is this is an area where lots of tourists go in the summer, so they don't actually really know the area necessarily that well. So the life safety model was used to assess where the best places for refuges were, but also it informed the signage that was put up. So you can see here next to this road sign, there's a tsunami evacuation route, basically saying if you hear the tsunami warning, this is the way where you should go. And then when you reach the refuge, um, this is um, where you should stop. So um, I'll move on to another case study, um, which was done a number of years ago to um, basically to validate the, the life safety model. So this is a case study of the Malpasse Dam, which was a dam in France, constructed, started construction in 1954, about 60 meters, 65, 66 meters high. So here we are in the south of France, near Nice, about seven kilometers upstream of Fréjus, for those of you who know that part of the world. So this is the Malpasse Dam, just after it was constructed. And this is what happened in 1959. It was a pretty serious failure, uh, sent um, a pretty dramatic wall of water downstream, as you can see, 40 meters high, real devastation. Those are some of the pictures taken after it. Um, probably around 450 to 500 people killed probably 150 to 160 buildings destroyed. So a pretty terrible event. Um, and the life safety model was employed to see if it gave credible results. This was when it was being developed. Um, so this is some time ago, and this result was, was done um, to commemorate the 50th anniversary. So this, this work was sort of done between 2007 and 2009. So here we have a animation this is the body you can see the blue coming in that's from the so in this case the dots of the building and where they turn red it's where they've collapsed and this was used to validate to see what is it giving credible um is the life safety model giving credible numbers of buildings collapsing and also um credible numbers of um of people in terms of the actual fatalities that were noted um the third case study is canby island so for those of you um, in the UK or not in the UK, 
Um, Canvey Island is located in the Thames Estuary, about 40 kilometers to the east of, our, um, east of um, London. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of atypical for the UK in that it's a bit like the Netherlands. It's, it's just about an island. Here we have a road map, it's just about an island. But most of the land on the island is below mean sea level. That's to say um, it's surrounded by flood defences. Those flood defences weren't there. And then during a high tide, it will be inundated. The other thing to notice is that quite a lot of people live there. This is about, I think, 20K across, 20 kilometres. There's about 38,000 people live there. If they had to evacu evacuate, you can see the road network. Everyone has to go out via this. If you look at the slide, the road map, via the same roundabout. So it would be very hard to evacuate this quickly. So that's the Environment Agency's flood map of uh, Canby Island. So the, uh, the pink or the purple dotted line is the flood defences, the flood embankment to protect it. And that's the area that will be undated in, I think, in a one in a hundred year, a 1% annual probability flood. So it would all be underwater. So, in 1953, there was a big surge in the North Sea, which resulted in thousands of fatalities in Europe, uh, mainly in the Netherlands and Belgium, but also 300 fatalities, around 300 fatalities in the UK or in, in the east of England, where flood defences failed. And that's what happened on Canby Island. The defences failed and around 60 people died as a result. The flooding happened in the early morning. People didn't get a warning or there wasn't much warning. The defences failed lot of vulnerable housing. So you can see on the right hand side of this slide, um, um, that's Canby Island at the top. You can barely see it, it's basically all underwater. And then those other two pictures are, are people in boats and some of the houses. So um, we, we used the life safety model there to validate it, but we also used it to represent current circumstances. And one of the reasons we thought was kind of interesting for that is that Canby Island is a bit different from the rest of the UK, not just because of its low levels, but because in the UK, 90% of the houses have an upstairs. So 90% of houses have at least two stories. So you can go upstairs. If there's a flood and it's not say more than two or three meters, you can escape it by going upstairs. In Canby Island, it's atypical in the 50% of the houses don't have an upstairs, they're bungalows, they just have one floor. So they're things like this. And they've been built, a lot of them quite recently, maybe in the last 20 years. And some of them like these ones are prefabricated. And if another event like 1953 did happen, that's the type of flood water level you'd have. So you haven't got anywhere to go if you're trapped in your house. Of course, since 1953, the flood defenses have been raised and strengthened. So the probability of such an event happening is much, much, much lower. But it's not to say it couldn't happen. So. Um, this is the 1953 event. This is a bit of a clunky animation. This is one of the first models we did. Um, you can see the blue coming in from the um, failed flood defences. And these are the people moving slightly out of sync, unfortunately, with the, uh, the flood hazard. The, the yellow people are, are, um, are evacuating, are trying to get out of the, the flood. And the red is where people, where there have been fatalities. So we did this to, as I say, to validate the model. And we got reasonably good answers, again, you know, in this type of world, you're doing well if you're plus or minus. Fifty percent, you're not looking for to the number of fatalities and improving your emergency plan. So coming back to the present day in, in Canby Island, we thought, well, there's all these people living, 50% of the population about living in houses that don't have an upper floor like this. So if the flood wave hits their bungalow and they don't have a warning, they're potentially in real trouble. So what could you do? Well, there's 50% of people who've got houses with an upstairs and generally their houses will be robust enough to survive the flood. And also the water level is such that you can go upstairs and you can escape the flood water. So maybe you could have this system that we sort of called a a flood buddy system where the person who lives in a, a house which doesn't have an upstairs, who lives in a bungalow, can team up with someone who does have an upstairs. So if they get a flood warning, rather than staying in their bungalow, they can walk, and, and most of these places are within walking distance, and they can go knock on their neighbor's door and go upstairs and reach safety. And we did some modeling. We looked, how does this affect the loss of life? 
So this is for the current day Canby Island. We reckoned if you had no warning and there was a, a failure of the flood defences with a similar type of flood that happened in 1953, you could get around 350 fatalities. As I said, that's a sort of plus or minus 50%, maybe more figure. But what was interesting was that if you had um, a flood buddy system in place where, where people knew where to go, knew where, which neighbour to go to, um, even if they didn't get a warning, you could reduce those number, that number of fatality from about 350 to 100. If they got a warning, you could reduce it to zero just by them going to their nearest neighbour with an upper, upstairs and then going upstairs. So that's an intervention that looks, you know, looks practicable. It's cheap. Um, it involves a bit of education and awareness, but you could potentially significantly reduce um, fatalities. And, and the final case study, I, I talked about this to the rivers and coastal groups. I'm not going to spend very much time on this, literally only about um, three weeks ago, was the Brumandinho tailings dam in Brazil, which was a tailings dam for a mine about 70 metres high, which, which failed very suddenly uh, just over two years ago um, on the 25th of January. So that's what it looked like. This is it when it failed. Sent a, a wall of mud downstream, killing around 300 people. And uh, again, we had a look at this to see how well the model worked. So this is the, the mud wave, the blue going downstream. This is an animation and you can see the dots of the people. Um, so you can see where the fatalities occurred. You've got villages downstream. And, and we recreated this and again, got, got pretty reasonable results compared to what was actually reported in this event. So it allows you, the life safety model allows you to picture where the, um, the fatalities were. So here you've got a map of the fatalities. The, the bigger the, the circle, the more fatalities. Most of the fatalities in this case were the mine workers who were having lunch. This happened at lunchtime uh, and working just downstream of the dam. Um, but the other thing it allows you to do um, is look at, um, you know, how much warning would you need if everyone was going to get out without incurring any fatalities? And you could see, well, we need about 15 minutes warning. If you can give people 15 minutes warning, everyone could potentially survive. Even if you give them a warning as the dam fails, that does reduce fatalities. So these are the type of things that, that um, you can look at and the type of interventions you can look at. I, I won't talk about this anymore because as I said I, I spoke about this um, about three weeks ago and I think there's a recording of that on the SciWEM YouTube, YouTube site. So um, I'll, I'll, I don't want to talk for too long so I will conclude. Um, there is a, a website for the life safety model which is, is sort of a, more luck than judgment which was launched yesterday so it's a new site that we've just upgraded which we've, we've, we've launched yesterday. That's the um, website. Um, we also made another big decision, which we're going to launch the life safety model as a piece of freeware. So it will be free to download. It's not currently free to download because there's a few uh, legal and technical things that we need to sort out. But we're hoping it will be available to um, download from the site by the end of April, hopefully the beginning of May at the latest. Uh, I have to be honest with you, we won't be able to support it. So it will be un an unsupported piece of freeware. There will be um, there will be a manual and and a, a, a data, and we will offer some training if you need it and we'll have to charge for that because we're giving the software away. But that's kind of a big step forward because we think this is a useful tool that can be used um, certainly for dam breaks, certainly for flood defences where there's people at risk. If you've got the data, sort of anywhere in the world. So if you're interested, do go and have a look at the website. There's um, lots of publications if you if you have a search around there and you I think you can register and then we'll let you know when the uh, software is available to freely download. Um, and I'll just bring your attention just to a, a couple of papers that we've written. This one called Use of an Agent-Based Model and Monte Carlo Analysis to Estimate Effectiveness of Emergency Management um, for Extreme Floods. That's primarily about the work we did on Canby Island and looking at the flood buddy system. And that was published about three years ago. And then one that I mentioned in the Brumandinho talk um, about modeling the Brumandinho tailings dam failure and the loss of life. And that was published literally about two months ago. So both of those, both this paper in the Journal of Flood Risk Management and this one in the Journal of Natural Hazards and Earth System Science, they're both open access. So you can go and find those. Or you can go to the Life Safety Model website. And there's, if you look for the publications bit, you'll probably have to dig around a bit. Um, there will be links to those publications. So um, 
no no thanks very much for um listening and if you've got any questions and I'll, I'll do my best to uh, to answer them yeah okay thanks darren i'll just find out how to uh, put my video back on so we've got a few um a few in the q a box and there's a few i think popping into the chat um so just remind everyone to put them in the in the q a box um and I'll, I'll do them in order i think there's quite a few um so first one we've got from frederick uh Larette. Oh, sorry, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. <laughs> Larette uh, it says, "Thank you, Darren. What is the height you consider brackets top of head, top of level, top 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 level of legs brackets? Because moving with water over waist height proves to be proves to be difficult. And between escaping by car or foot, what about bicycle brackets? Few traffic jams, faster than f escaping by foot. Do you have a written paper about what you've talked about today? So I think there's a few <laughs> elements in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, where to start? Um, so, so the uh, to start with the people. So the people is, is you know there, there are that comes from empirical data, and it is related to the height and, and mass of the people. And so, if if you look at the um, the Canby Island paper, the one in the Journal of Flood Risk Management, um, this one um, here, if you can see, still see the screen. That that paper there has got yep. um, a lot of um, information on the the characteristics of people and how they affect fatalities but it is related to the the um their characteristics primarily their mass and primarily their height but we've linked that to various other things um but it's basically empirical data so it's all related to empirical data i, I should mention also that that it's not just about the velocity and depth of water there's also exposure so if people are in water and the water's been defined to be below a certain temperature and they're in the water for a certain length of time then they can potentially die of exposure um what was the second part bicycles we don't have bicycles in the model to be honest um we it, it, at the minute it just has people evacuating um via by vehicle by car and um on foot so we don't have bikes at the minute i'm not sure if that's something where we put in but it, it could potentially be more effective i mean uh, it, it's something we might think about in the future. And then as I said, if you want to look at the papers, then there's this paper, that paper. And then if you go to the, the website, there is a link to a lot of papers, not just written by ourselves, written by others as well. Okay, thank you. So we've got another one um, from Astif Aslam, who says, can you uh, consider ice jam impacts? Not quite sure what's meant by that. Um, I, I think I think um, probably I mean probably not. I mean um, it, it depends what you mean. If, if you're talking about global lake um, outburst floods where you get um, a, um, a you know a, a glacial lake that breaks, then you can because basically the the life safety model sits apart from the input, which comes from a, a, a high two dimensional hydraulic model. So that can be either a Newtonian flow model, you know things like two flow which are used for floods, um, you know, um, InfoWorks, all those type of models. Um, but you can also use, um, which we did on the Brumandinho, we used um, output from Mike 21. So we had a non-Newtonian mud flow model, which we used. And, and we, in that case, we changed the vulnerability functions because of course, um, mud has a greater impact on both people, people in buildings or mud flow does than water. It, it, it's even, it, yeah, it, it, it's it's significantly um, worse in terms of the outputs. I'm not sure if that's quite answered the question. Hopefully. Okay, thank you. Um, next one's from Isabel Ruin. Says, thank you, Darren. How do you consider the distribution of people in the daytime? As people are not always in their homes, uh, they are attending to daily activities according to their own schedule. Do you take this into account? Uh, that's a good question you can do so there's multiple scenarios you can model often we're looking at the worst case where we have all the people but of course yeah, if you want to get the true risk then you need to consider the time that the event ha happens at so you can you can set all that up you can set different um buildings up different types of buildings you can have schools you can have houses so you can have for example one scenario which might be say i don't know 10 o'clock on a on a Monday morning where you would expect children maybe to be at school, maybe people not now, but maybe people to have been in their offices 
And then you might have another situation where it might be a, a Saturday night or a Sunday, Sunday morning at one o'clock in the morning where you would expect most people to be home at night. So you can look at all those. And, and to be honest, if you want to do a, a risk assessment rather than emergency planning, then you should be looking at all those different scenarios. So yeah, you can set them up and um, it's just a question of changing where people are in the model and then you can see how they react and how the fatalities and and that's is what done is is what's done certainly by bc hydro when they're carrying out they're using this model mainly for risk assessments they're looking at a number of scenarios so not in terms of the flood i mean in terms of where people are located what they're doing and what time the disaster happens at okay thank you um and another one from from isabel again um do you consider people to respond oh sorry it keeps jumping around do you consider people to respond to warning immediately without looking for further information before taking protection um you can set the response time so that was one of the things we if you look at the the brumandino paper that we look to see how response time affects the number of fatalities so that can be set um so, you know, you can set that from anything from they can react as soon as they hear a warning to infinity, to be honest. So any number. So you, you can set that. And that's another sensitivity that's worth looking at. Um, of course, another thing that we look at is how many people actually respond, because um, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, not everyone responds to warnings. There's always a percentage of people who won't respond for whatever reason. So you can also look to say, well, a certain percentage of people won't respond. Um, you can also look to see how many people actually get the warning and and also you can also set it up so that people can convey warnings maybe if you're living in a particularly close community where people actually go and tell their neighbor look we've heard there's a flood um you need to do something you can have that type of thing in the model so basically you can vary you can you can vary all those different parameters okay thank you uh next one from tez a baby says, uh, as I got, as I, I'm oh, sorry, oh, keeps jumping, the thing keeps jumping around. Uh, I've just lost it. As I got an answer to my previous question, I would like to expand um, or about the time warning. What warning systems exist in these different cases and countries? Many thanks. Is that partly what was um, covered already or? Yeah, well, sort of in, in, in the model, um, what, I, I mean, maybe I'll speak to what happens in the model. So what you can have in the model is you can have a, a warning centre and you can set the speed at which So you have a, a essentially, as far as the model is concerned, you have a point in the model which acts as a warning centre and you have a speed at which that warning radiates out from that and reaches people. So that's how it's done in the model. And then, as I mentioned in the slide, so people have different statuses. So initially, if they don't receive a warning or if they, they can't see the flood, if the flood doesn't reach them, they're unaware. But as soon as they receive a warning, then they become aware and they can decide what to do. The agent in the model can decide what to do. So they may be set. So they might say, well, I'm not evacuating for two minutes, three minutes, an hour. So basically, it's sort of a, it's it, in the model, it's a function that you can set up, have a sort of a, a speed of warning. But it, it, it's, it's just radiating out, radiating out from a, what we call a warning center in the model. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, from Anonymous, um, thanks Darren, really interesting talk. Are there any plans to use the model for other hazards slash evacuation applications? Um, possibly, I mean, um, I mean, uh, one thing I didn't mention, which is worth mentioning, you can, you can run the model in the dry. So what I mean by that is you don't have to have um, the results from a hydrodynamic model um, if you just want to run it in evacuation mode. So um, we've done a few studies with some consultants in Australia, actually, where it's flooding now in New South Wales, because in, in some of the sub suburbs of Sydney, some of the new developments there in, in Australia, they want to see, because the flood extent is so large or so wide, they want to see that if there's a flood warning that people can evacuate on, on time. So it has been used there just primarily to assess evacuation evacuation times because you're not interlinking with the hazard so you're not getting the fatalities you're just saying it will take this long to um, interact so it's something we've we've thought about I mean it, it does depend what hazard because um, you know things like for example wildfires are quite tricky so we've used it 
for two things, which is 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 well is, is floods from from dams and, and rivers and and then tailings dams where you've got mud flow, non Newtonian flow. But you could potentially use it for other hazards. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got one from uh, Leisha Parambath says, how are the warnings uh, given to the people in such short notice as in the case of the dam breach scenario? Well, that's a good that's a good question. I mean, um, <clears throat> so going, going to back to the, to the Brumandinho case study in Brazil, there were actual sirens. Um, so one way is to have sirens. So as soon as something happens, you can have a siren triggered as the dam fails. And in fact, I mean, that was also the case in Canby Island. I mean, um, until recently, I think they were decommissioned a few years ago, but probably in the last 10 years on Canby Island, they had sirens. So um, of course, now a lot of people have mobile phones and et cetera, et cetera. You can reach them via that, but, but sirens isn't a bad way. And in fact, actually after the Brumandinho tailings dam failed, there's another dam adjacent to it, which is a water retaining dam. And that got damaged and there was a concern that that was going to fail as well and and that's exactly what happened they used the sirens which for whatever reason i don't think went off when the tailing stand failed to warn people that there was a potential danger from that so that that's one way of doing it okay thank you uh the next one i think the person tim hess has commented saying i think this question's been answered thanks um do you want me to read that darren or shall i just skip that on to the next I don't, mind, well, no, I don't mind. <laughs> I think he's saying it's been answered already. Uh, next one from Ben Murray. Um, so thank you. Really interesting. Oh, sorry. It keeps jumping around. Could the LSM be used to support RTL damages assessment on the English flood scheme appraisal as a replacement for the 2014 DEFRA guidance? And someone called Steve King uh, also had the same question about 2008 DEFRA guidance. Uh yeah, it could be. I mean, I think, I think, um, I mean, to be honest, I think one of the reasons that a lot of people use the deference gu defra guidance is it, it, it's, it's, it's much more, it, it's cheaper, basically. So in terms of person hours, it, it takes much less time. So it, it kind of depends what you want to do. I mean, ideally, I, you know, we would like to see this, this model used um, more, more widely, certainly in the UK. But it's kind of horses for courses because um, the DEFRA methodology can easily apply in, in, in a GIS. It, it will take you significantly less time. So it depends what you want. It depends what you want. If you, I think if you want to improve emergency plans, then it, it's really useful. If you want to get a better, if you really need a better estimate of risk, it's useful. And if you've got the time and the money. Now, I think, you know, personally, I think that, 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 that if, you know, the environment agency in the UK should be using it, but you know, I know, I understand that there's limited budget, so it, it depends, really. It's certainly, I, I would say, um, I shouldn't probably say this, more cost effective to use the, the DEFRA methodology, but it doesn't give you as much information. So it depends what you want to get out of it. OK, thank you. Um, so. Oh. OK, sorry, next one. Richard Simmons. Um, thank you, Darren. Very interesting. Do you think this LSM could be used actively during the planning assessment for proposed developments? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be. It, 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 it could be. I mean, uh, as I said, in, in Australia, it is because I think, or well, certainly in, in New South Wales, where we've been involved in two or three studies, I think three studies now, you have to show that you can evacuate. Um, we have done some studies as well where we use this with with some other tools that that some dutch colleagues um or, or from dhv um implemented to look at how long it would take to evacuate various um parts of the east coast of england so it, again it you know it, it depends because it, this um the life safety model does have a traffic model of course, when, when people are planning new developments, certainly uh, my understanding is in the UK, there's some very, very sophisticated traffic models. And I, I wouldn't want to pretend that the, the, the traffic model in the life safety model is, is anywhere near as sophisticated as, as any of the models that are used by traffic planners. It's not. So it, again, it, you could do it. It depends what you want to do, really. It depends what you want to get out of it. And it, it depends um, where you are in the world, what data you have, and, and how useful you think it will be. 
Okay, thank you. Um, got another one from Tez uh, Abebe, but I think we may have answered this. He said, are there any good mobile apps on flooding, uh, which proved to be a good asset during the flood, during the event flooding? I think he's getting there, you know, about the warnings getting to people's phones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, uh, I think it, I get, we are, it depends where you are in the world, really, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one from Barry Evans said, do you consider uh, interactions between different agent types, i.e. how people uh, attempting to evacuate by foot are hindered by vehicles on the road and vice versa? So, obviously, you know, bicycles as mentioned earlier. Um, um, no, the, well, the, the straight answer is no. There's no interaction uh, between people on, on foot and, and the vehicles. Um, there is, I mean, there is congestion, so you can get congestions of roundabouts, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and you can set the capacity of refuges as safe havens. So you can get to the point where people maybe arrive at a safe haven and you've set the capacity, it might be full. So there's no direct interaction between the people in the vehicles. There is interaction between the vehicles, which can lead to congestion and slow down. Okay, thank you. Uh, one from Albert Chen says, thanks for the interesting talk. In the model, do you consider distance and other factors such as climbing up slope along the evacuation route, which might affect the movements for elderly or people with disabilities? That's a good one. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So um, you can set the characteristics of the people. So they're not determined by the slope, but they you can are determined by their age. So you can set the, a slow walking speed. So you look at, I mean, what we generally do is look at the census data, look at the profile of the population, and that's how the population at risk is set up. So, um, so yes, so the answer is yes, you can. You can also group people together. So you can have, say, for example, a family group, um, which might be, say, four people, and then they will move at the speed of the slowest person. So in essence, you can, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, from Anonymous, uh, thanks, Darren. Interesting talk. Is it possible to combine your model and the result of the HEC RAS 2D model? Some, uh, someone called Mark Davis Davison has, also, has replied to that, actually saying, yes, this is possible. It's been done in Canada. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yes, yes, I bet, yeah, we, yes, you can. <laughs> Okay, right, that one's, uh, and then they've got a final one at the moment. The question. <laughs> uh, Doug Boyer says, how does LSM compare to other agent-based models such as the Corp, Corps of Engineer Life Sim model? Um, in, well, we have done some results. I mean, we're, we're, we have a meeting every, about every two years with the um, US Army Corps and various other people who are interested in this type of thing. Um, and, and we're actually, we're having another, there's another uh, meeting in May where, where Mark has just answered that question and, and I will be attending, not in person, but virtually. So, I mean, we think it compares pretty well. We're not always exactly sure what the US Army Corps Engineers Live Sim model does under the bonnet. Um, but yeah, we, I think we, all I can say is we, we've done some, some tests and we think it compares well.